Welcome to the Precious Testimonies broadcast. I'm Norm Rasmussen, your host. In the Old Testament book of Psalm, chapter 96, verse 3, it reads, Declare God's glory among the nations. Well, Precious Testimonies has been called of God to do just that. And we're to do that by giving born-again Christians an opportunity to share what Jesus has done in their lives to the glory of God the Father and, of course, the Holy Spirit and, of course, Jesus himself. And so with that, we're going to let you hear some people sharing how uh, God has worked in their lives and what this Jesus has done for them and what he means to them. And I pray that this will be something God uses to either help you come to uh, a precious relationship with God or grow in your relationship with God. And with that now, let's listen to what uh, some folks have to say about this great and mighty Savior whose name is Jesus Christ. Hi, my name is Red, I'm 31 years old, and I was born and raised in Richmond, Virginia. My father was a pimp, my mother was a prostitute. Um, we got left in the crack house, down Rough and Road Apartments, I'll never forget that. I was a kid, but I still remembered. And uh, for the most part, my whole life, I grew up in foster homes, back and forth, in and out of group homes, running away. And um, this happened to be one of the homes that I was tortured and abused in as a kid. I was actually tied down to the bed, butt naked, with the window open on a cold winter night, just, and I scraped was, I'm just beat up real bad with an electric cord, and uh, a couple times they put me in scalding hot water, so now it's to the point where I don't take real hot showers because it still bothers me. My sisters and brothers, they didn't go through so much abuse because I was being the bigger brother, and I stood, I stood up for my family. I got tortured more than they did because I was the one with the mouth, and, I wanted to make sure my sisters and brothers was okay. I got beat up every day going to school because of the color of my skin, because of the area I lived in. And there just was a whole lot going on. And uh, I didn't know how to get from underneath the problems that I was going through. I used to tell my father every day when he came through that I was getting abused, but he never believed me because this was a pastor and the first lady of a church. So he looked highly upon them like, you know, they would do no wrong. We used to have to go to church every day. We went to church so much sometimes I didn't want to go to church because it felt like we went to church every day like it was a school day. But uh, I used to play the drums, I used to sing in the church choir, I used to do all them things. But once I started getting abused and going through the things I went through, it like it just stirred me away from that and stirred me away from God. And it changed my whole life, it changed my heart. I started off a nice, humble person and it turned me into an animal. One day I went to school and I had whips all over my body and I couldn't. I got beat so bad I couldn't sit down in my seat, in my seat at school. And uh, I went to the t principal's office and they took the pictures of me and they ended up locking the family up and um, I never heard from them again. But when I was 10 years old, me and my father were sitting out the projects waiting on my brother to come outside and he come outside and we just see him talking to two guys and all of a sudden I just hear a shot and I look up and my brother's brains is all over the front of our car and uh, my dad out there crying and I didn't know what to do, I'm hysterical. I'm just looking at my father holding my brother in his hand, just crying and uh, a lot of real stuff happened out there where I live at and uh, just growing up in these different areas, it just changed my mind and made me real evil. So when I went to school, I just lashed out real bad on the teachers. I disrespected everybody. I was, I just couldn't, I had no control. I just, I felt like the anger that I, went through and the pain that I went through, I wanted to take it on somebody else. I wanted somebody else to hurt the way I hurt. As I got older, I started getting into serious crimes and breaking in people's houses. And I was robbing people for anything, just doing stupid stuff. And I got locked up and had to go to the penitentiary for five years. I learned a lot being locked up. Um, I learned a lot of trades and different things, went to school, but I still felt lost. Like, 
I took it as a joke. For the whole five years, I just ran around, played, got high, got high while I was in prison. And um, when I came home, I just thought I was better than everybody. I came home with the wrong attitude. I turned into a womanizer, and I, and, I, and I didn't know how to treat certain females in my life because I never had that family. I always wanted a family. I never had one because my family was so disoriented. All my sisters and brothers, everybody split up in different homes. And my father, he still was on drugs. My mother still doing her. Even at the age of 50-some years old, she's still out there prostituting, doing the same thing. And it hurts me every day to think about that. And uh, I just felt so lost. It just, I just felt like getting high was the best thing in the world. It just covered up all my pain that I went through and all the torture. And uh, every day, I just, I just looked and thought that uh, things was going to get better. But they didn't get better because I was running away from my problems. I wasn't facing them. But one day, one day, I got introduced to The Rock on Walk Road, and uh, I went from there. I just started working out every day and trying to find a new place to fit in. I still wasn't serious about coming to the church because, for real, I still was thinking about a lot of emotional stuff that when I grew up in the church and a lot of the stuff that I went through with the people from the church. and. Uh, it just was real cool to come to the church service and see that it was all t different colors and races and everybody was getting along and it just felt like everything was real, everything was different. It was like everybody was so loving and warm and wanted to see you do better and it just made me look at things a lot different and plus I just knew when I talked to Pastor G it was just meant for me to come to this church because I knew in my heart that this was the right place. At first I was just worrying about the gym, gym, gym. But I knew it was the reason why God wanted me to keep coming to the gym, which was to get introduced to the church. And he wanted me to be in some kind of church home. Eventually, I moved out of the projects and I talked to the pastor about moving to the RSUM. And uh, that was the best thing ever that happened to me. I just felt every day I woke up, I was peaceful. I didn't have to wake up to gunshots. It, just a, lot, it was a lot of peace and everything was different. Um, I just wanted to get closer with God and get my walk right because I got tired of living the way I was living because I was miserable. I, I got tired of doing things on my own and I know without him in my life I can't have no guidance and I'm not going to ever make it right. So one day before the, um, the big house opened up I just put up on the pass and was like I hope I can get a job running the fitness center one day when the new rock opened up and uh, I guess God answered my prayer because when the new fitness center opened up I was able to get the job working in the fitness center and now that I'm at The Rock, everything is just wonderful. Every day I get up, I look forward to going to work. Having a gym job is the best opportunity I ever could have. I'm in there working with people every day. And I just love what I do. It just changed my life. It just, it just feels so good to be positive and do positive things now. And be in a different environment from where I came from. I was all negative and being around the wrong people. So now I'm around a lot more positive people. And I know I couldn't do nothing without God. And, I'm just happy to be here and I just, it's not easy, but every day I try to improve each and every day and try to read my Bible more, try to get more focused and closer to God and hope that everybody loves me but one day because I came from a long way and um, I'm here today and I'm here to stay. I'm at the rock, babe, and I ain't going nowhere. Imagine staying in this moment, staying in this moment forever. It's true. Grew up in Winchester, Kentucky. Um, normal, messed up, broken home childhood. My dad left when I was six. Kind of planted the, the seed of uh, not understanding right then why stuff happened. Uh, as I got older, you know, I looked up to some guys. My friends were older. I looked up to some guys, and they were messing around with drugs. I, I got involved with drugs with them. Uh, you know, one thing led to another, um, you know, breaking down relationships with family, uh, with my brother, my sister, mom, just tearing those down. Uh, I get to be a little older, I'm dealing more with hardcore drugs, psychedelics, cocaine, pills. Uh, as I'm doing that, uh, I'm getting arrested, I'm 
you know, in and out of jail just for drugs this, drugs that, and it's, you know, constant trouble, constant trouble at home. You know, I kind of grown up in a, in a church. I went to church with a family friend, and through all that, I, you know, through all the partying, I just gotten away from anything to do with God. Just kind of was like, well, you know, that's not really for me. I could touch drugs and see drugs. That's what was there. So I depended more on that. I decided when I was 15, you know, maybe maybe I should try to move to my dad's, create more of a relationship with him. I moved there. Uh, we have problems just because I still hadn't forgiven him for, uh, for, you know, him leaving when I was six. Uh, it just leads me to even more partying, even more messing up. So I moved to North Carolina with my sister. Uh, once I got there, it was even worse drugs. It was, you know, then I'm really dealing with cocaine and I'm drinking heavily, um, hanging out with just people that I shouldn't be. And uh, that just obviously wasn't what I was supposed to be doing. I was 20 years old and I got my second DUI within the course of 30 days. Um, I went to jail, my sister came and got me out, they were trying to give me another chance. I didn't want that chance, they you know, were harping on me, you need to get it straight, you need to get right, and uh, I didn't like them telling me what to do, and uh, I decided, you know, they made me mad one night, why not just burn their apartment complex down so I don't have to deal with them telling me what to do anymore. Uh, I went, uh, they had a couch sitting outside, I burnt the couch, uh, cops show up, ambulance, fire trucks, news reporters, everybody shows up. After that I go to prison for six months for the DUIs and burning the couch and you know I get out and I'm ready to do my own thing again. I got all that behind me, already forgot about God, that he was trying to teach me a lesson and uh, I go try to do it on my own again. I move back to Kentucky, um, get back to Kentucky and it's just even worse. It's pills, it's heroin, it's everything that you can imagine. I'm shooting up, I'm snorting it, I can't even function without it. You know, I really just start looking at it like, you know, what is my, what is my purpose? Like, what am I trying to do with my life right now? Um, forgetting that God had been calling me a million times, I still overlooked that and tried to do it my own way, uh, selling drugs. I, I sold to an undercover cop. Um, I sold three pills to him, and that was it. I'm going to jail for three to 15 years. I'm already on probation for having pills. Now I'm selling them to an undercover cop, and now it's looking like uh, I'm gonna do three to 15 years. But one day, you know, it just so happens that night, um, whether I knew it or not, you know, God shows up at my doorstep in the form of a friend I hadn't seen in six, seven, eight months. And uh, he tells me about a place called The Rock, the Richmond Outreach Center. Um, you know, at this point, I'm in jail. I lost all my friends, all my families. I cut all the ties with work, with my grandparents, with everything that I had going for me. It's like everything was shut down. And then I got this guy telling me I can move 500 miles away to uh, you know, go to a rehab for a church. And uh, that's what I decided to do. And June 3rd of 2009, I came to the Richmond Outreach Center. I go to Thursday night Bible study at the youth center. It's in the gym. And I'm thinking, man, there's more people on stage than I've ever seen in a whole church. And, uh, you know, I'm really just like floored. I mean, they got the band, you know, I love, you know, rock music and they're playing rock music and they're rapping and they got kids dancing and they're doing all this stuff. Little did I know God was really just setting me up to be in a spot where uh, I was going to learn from, you know, all the leaders that I served under. I had old school, Tom, Pastor Ranch, Andrew, Brandon, Oren, uh, you know, just everybody that I got to serve under here. And little did I know they were training me up to be a leader. I get to uh, be blessed with running the Rock Cafe and it's really like I'm a small business owner. I mean, it's more than I could have really asked for. You know, really when I look back, I, everybody told me, oh, you're funny, you ought to do this, you ought to be a comedian, and that's something I always wanted to do. And now I get to do the kids skits for the greatest kids service in America. And just seeing them smile while we're out up there making them laugh and teaching them the Word of God while we're doing it, 
You know, there's no, there's no greater feeling than knowing that they're getting the Word of God and having a good time. And that's the best part, really, about doing the skits. Just everything that I'm doing now, it's kind of like I look back and, you know, me rejecting church once I started hanging out with this crowd was just a way for God to really set me up to work for Him later on. You know, I really just look forward to each and every day, you know, getting up, coming to serve God and um, seeing people's lives changed and seeing, you know, what, what you know, is going to happen the next day. I've seen, you know, miracle after miracle after miracle, and it's just exciting to be a part of that. Hi, my name's Cam. I'm 32 years old. I was born and raised in Virginia Beach, Virginia. Hi, my name is Amber. I'm 32 years old. I was born and raised in Virginia Beach, Virginia. Okay, um, I started off half of my childhood in a Christian family. One day they baptized me when I was really young and I actually thought they were trying to drown me. So that kind of really scared me from going to church because I had no idea what was going on. Um, I got my real boyfriend when I was about 14 years old. Um, he actually was two years older than me. So he was able to buy us beer and cigarettes for me, and uh, we just started partying a little bit. Uh, needless to say, I was pregnant when I was 18. Um, my dad was never around, so my mom was always at work, so I was pretty much rebellious. Around that time, that's when my friends started selling weed, and I wanted to sell something too, but not quite the same, so I started selling cocaine. And a little later on after that, I started cooking it, and. The more I sold, the more people I met. And the more people I met, the different drugs I was introduced to, and I started trading them as I would sell to them. So, I mean, cocaine went to ecstasy, to acid, to, I mean, crystal meth. I just dibbled and dabbed in a little bit of all of it. Uh, two years after that, Chris passed away. Um, he had a heart attack. He was 27. I took his death very hard. Um, I was introduced to heroin, and that gave me um, life back almost in a weird way because it numbed me, and I didn't. I was able to forget about Chris and not feel sad. When I was about 23 years old, I met Amber. Along this time, um, I ended up meeting Cam, and he knew I was using heroin, but um, I kind of hid it from him. She began to get a little more sicker, I noticed, at times, and that's when I found out she was shooting it. So every time I noticed she would shoot it, I would tell myself that I would do it unless she stopped. So that's how I got addicted to actually shooting heroin, and that carried on for a long time. Soon after that, though, we um, lost the place we were staying in. It wasn't long before we both were jobless and homeless. Um, we began doing whatever we could to get money to either get a hotel room and our drugs and if we didn't have both we were sleeping in the car because our drugs were more important at that time. After that we started getting charges. Uh, I started going to jail, she started going to jail. You know we were in and out of jail it seemed like every week for something. After a while, <clears throat> just doing all the hustles that I used to do, um, they started running out. And when they started running out, I mean, it was just more cops and more everything. And like I had burnt all my bridges. I mean, I had no one else to talk to. It's just um, never gonna end if we don't stop it. And now I'm pregnant, so what do we do? But one day, but one day. Shortly after that, we started running with another couple who was kind of in the same boat we were in because we figured if we were with someone else, we could have a place to stay because it'd be less money. We'd only have to pay half for the hotel room and still have more money to feed our addiction. We did that for a couple months and then I guess the couple's parents, they got fed up with it and they're from Richmond, so they knew about this place called The Rock. And she told me to call the number, this place could uh, get us help. I mean, just, we wouldn't have to do what we were doing anymore. That's when we just looked at each, each other and within an hour we were on the road to The Rock. And um, 
I know now that it was definitely in God's plan for me to become pregnant because uh, I don't think we would have made it here if I hadn't become pregnant. I really believe that. Um. When I pulled up to the rock, it almost looked like uh, a concert was going on. And when we got in, I was even more surprised. I was like, whoa. I remember just sitting in there and looking at all the different people. And then Pastor G comes out, and I'll never forget it. Uh, January 8, 2011, he was preaching the message on Noah's Ark and the boat and being shut in and shut out. When he did the altar call, something was just like, move, move. And I looked around and no one else that was with me was moving, but something just kept telling me to move, move, move. And when I finally got up there, um, I don't really remember who it was, but I started praying with somebody and I just started crying in the middle of the prayer. So I came into the house of life. I stayed there up until I had Isaac. But before we had Isaac, we and Pastor G married us on April 29th. Since we've been here at The Rock, I can honestly say we've been the happiest we've been in years. Um, we've been sober for a year now, and um, I just can't stress how much God has made that all possible, because um, we definitely would not be here without God. I know that now, and I know that he's the reason why Isaac was born. He's the reason why we came to Richmond knowing nobody. We had no family here. We knew nobody. And <clears throat> everybody here at The Rock has opened their arms to us um, like we've been here for years. I mean, and it's just been a blessing. Everybody has been a blessing to us, and it's... Um, praise to God really for everything that he's he's done for us working with the kids I've never um, done that before so that was definitely God's will too to put me through with the kids and um, we just thank him every day for him bringing us here and restoring um, our lives with our children and our families and thank you <laughs> Hi, I'm Donna. I'm from Richmond, Virginia, and I'm 45 years old. The memories that I have of my church and my God when I was young were mostly um, how God was, you know, the punisher kind of thing. Um, I was raised to believe that baptism is what got you saved and how you got to heaven. And I can remember during communion, you know, you could not partake of the communion unless you had been baptized. So I'd kind of sit there wanting to, but I was afraid that God was going to, you know, strike me dead if I took any of the communion. So my, my life was, um, it was really simple, you know, a good, good childhood. I have really nothing, nothing to complain about. Now I graduated in 84, and when I graduated, um, I had never drank, never taken a drug, never smoked a cigarette, and I never had sex. So once I graduated, from high school, I went on to VCU, and I majored in fashion illustration. When I got to college, you know, I was living in the dorm, it was my first time I'd ever been on my own. I started doing drugs, started drinking, and I started having sex right away, right, I mean, right in the get-go through college. Um, you know, right after I started drinking and, and doing drugs, I started to get really, really depressed. And that was the first time I can remember actually going to a therapist and asking for help and being put on some kind of antidepressant or some kind of, of drug for that. Another thing that I started doing when I was in college was binging and purging and starving myself. I've held on to that even the times that I've tried not to drink and I've tried not to do drugs. My eating disorder has constantly been a shadow of mine. After about two years of college, my grades really just, they, they sucked, you know, they were terrible. And I got suspended from BCU. So, I ended up moving back into my parents' house. I started going to a lot of bars. And I did meet a guy that I dated for almost a year. He was older, he was about nine years older than me. And then I got pregnant. And when I got pregnant, I, I didn't tell anybody but him and a couple of my friends. And the first thing he said that I should do is have an abortion. Um, so uh, obviously that relationship did not last, but what lasted from that was my guilt over having the abortion. 
you know, I, I could not forget it. It haunted me for years and years. Now, about a year after my abortion, I got really, really drunk, and uh, of course, when I got drunk, I would get really, really depressed about the abortion. So I actually uh, attempted suicide, and that was one of my first attempts at suicide. And I, the night that I got out of the, the psych unit, I was right back in the bar drinking. It, 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 it just didn't affect me. It was like I had no feelings towards that. All I could think about was forgetting everything and getting drunk. And I continued to. To, to do that, the club scene and the, and the drinking, and I ended up being, getting pregnant in 1990, so my son was born in July of 1991. When he was born, he did have some, some stuff wrong with him, had to have an emergency C-section, and he had actually lost three-fourths of his blood, so he was not expected to live through the night, and I can remember that I felt God was punishing me for having that abortion, you know, that still stuck in my mind that God was the big punisher in, in my life. And two years later, I'm pregnant again. And I'm pregnant with my daughter, Danielle, and I did not know who the father was, and that's the kind of life I, I, I lived. So right after she was born, I did meet this guy. He, his name is Steve. He was a bouncer at one of the clubs that I went to. Again, I started doing coke then. Then we actually did get married, and that was in 1995. And you know, I, I can remember that I really wasn't sure that I loved him. I was afraid I would be alone for the rest of my life. You know? And he would tell me things like, nobody's ever gonna want you. You've got two kids with two different dads. They, they're not gonna want you. They might wanna have sex with you, but they never wanna marry you. And I believe that. Um, I, did get, I had a baby with Steve, and Morgan was born in 97, September of 97. After Morgan was born, something, something happened to me. I just. I mean, my depression just got worse. I just I felt like I was in this deep hole and there was just no way to get out. So I was pretty much in denial. I, you know, I didn't want to even face the fact that my drinking and my drugs were, were the problem, that, that they weren't going to save me from all the, the, the bad things in my life, from my bad feelings that I was having. You know, the people that I was hanging around with and things that I was doing, uh, it, I was, I was going to be dead. And I just knew that I had to stop running. I had to stop. I had to stop what I was doing, and I needed some serious help. But one day, I was talking to my ex-husband. So, when we were talking about some different options for me, uh, you know, I was telling him that there's no, there's no housing, there's no halfway houses, no treatment facilities there that you don't have to pay, you know, like an $800 deposit on. And, that's when he told me about the rock and the discipleship homes. So I came to a Saturday, six o'clock rock. This is June 30th, 2007. And I just remember that I felt unbelievable that night. The, the message that I heard, the music, the people, I, I just felt this tremendous relief. Like all this weight had just come off my shoulder and that this is where I am supposed to be. You know, God was telling me, park your butt here. So that's what I did. I went into the house of Ruth that night, and that night I got saved. And the more I started to, to read the Bible and study, study God's Word, this, that sense of, of freedom and peace that I had just, just started to overflow. You know, and I remember one of the things that I said at, at devotions one morning, man, this stuff is addicting. You know, it, it, it is, it, it's better than any, any drug. I know this is where God wants me. I uh, stayed here. I was in the, the house for seven months. Then I, I actually went into full-time ministry. So God has truly blessed my life. He has uh, freed me from the bondage of drugs and alcohol, my depression, my eating disorder, you know, the, the, the crazy relationships that I have with men, the, the fact that I needed something else in this world to make me feel like I, I was somebody. The, God had just, that, that was a personal prison that I made, and God freed me from that. You know, and, and God gave me my children back in my life, a wonderful relationship with them, a wonderful husband. I couldn't ask for more. You know, it says in the Bible that God will give you the desires of your heart. I'm here to tell you, God will give you more than you could ever dream of. That's it. Imagine <laughs> staying in this moment. Hey, my name is Kyle. I was born in Chesterfield, Virginia, and I'm 24 years old. 
Growing up as a child, um, I had a family of, you know, my mother, my father. Um, very disciplined household, you know, typical, you know, American family, very patriotic, loves sports, um, very hardworking. Um, but being the middle child, I, I struggled a lot trying to compete with my brothers and sisters, you know, trying to, trying to get mom and dad's attention as much as possible. And the only way that I could do that is by acting out. So my dad came to me one day, he says, look, he says, son, he says, I'm going to send you to military school. He says, if you don't get your act together. And that was right about the same time that 9-11 happened. And um, I remember the day that uh, the, the Twin Towers fell. Uh, I told my dad I wanted to join the Marine Corps, you know, I wanted to join the military. Uh, I leave to go to boot camp and um, I graduate. Proudest moment my dad ever had for me. You know, I was a Marine, the hardest thing that you could possibly do. That's when I really started drinking is when I finally get to the fleet. Um, I started partying. I used to go out and uh, put down a $400 bar tab every night and hang out with friends and not get back until 3 in the morning and have to wake up at 5 and start running. Um, then eventually I was introduced into pills, taking Percocet, Oxycontin, sleeping around from woman to woman to woman every night with somebody different back at the barracks. Until one day I showed up to work drunk. You know, I'd started again actually putting on weight from all this. And, um, just backsliding, not, not caring about my appearance, not caring about my job, not caring about, you know, nothing. And uh, we had this new lieutenant that came in, and he was, he was telling me how to run the Marines. He was telling me that, you know, buy the book. And, and so I looked at this guy, and I said, well, who are you to tell me what to do? And uh, I, I, was, I was hammered, man. And I remember I acted out, and I swung on him, and I hit him. And uh, the MP showed up that day. And um, they, they arrested me and they, they locked me up in the brig for a couple weeks and they came to my cell and I remember them telling me like, well, we're going to have to ADCEP you out. You're going to have to leave. You can't come back and you can't re-enlist. So I called my dad and I lied to him about the reasons why I left, why I was being thrown out, you know, because I was ashamed of what I've done. And then I just kept drinking. I kept partying, kept doing my thing. I didn't, I didn't care about consequences. I cared about Kyle. To a point where my parents didn't want me around anymore. They were like, you got to go. You can't be here. My dad said, hey, well, I know about this place. He says, son, he says, I, I'm born again. And I'm all about Jesus Christ. And he, I would like to help you, son. He says, I know this place called The Rock. So he takes me to one of the pastors that he knew here. And uh, he sat me down and he introduced me to the Romans roads. And uh, I got saved that day. Well, I went to the house of Paul. And I remember what Tom told me. He says, he says this is going to be a culture shock for you, bro. He said, uh, you're going to struggle with a lot of things. And I didn't want to be here to begin with. And um, I'd been there for a couple weeks. I wasn't really here for the right reasons. You know, I still wanted to do what I wanted to do, go out and drink and just have fun, live the life for Kyle. And, you know, so I went out and I was, I was at work one day and I remember I ran my mouth to the wrong person, you know, just being completely disrespectful. And they could see my heart condition wasn't in it. And they told me that I had to go. And so I went back to the house, I packed my stuff. They dropped me off at my parents' house. And I remember, I remember that night they told me, you can't stay here. You can't stay here. But one day, and it, it was cold. It was, it was like 10 degrees outside. It just started snowing. I was like, man, what am, what am I going to do? So I just started walking. I'm in Chesterfield. I didn't know where I was going, you know. So I started walking to this building, you know, and I broke in and I started realizing that I'm not meant to be homeless. I'm really not. I'm not meant for this. So I, I slept there overnight. I called the cops the next day and I told them, I said, look, I said, I want to turn myself in. I broke into this building. You know, I want, I want to be arrested. So I was sitting in jail and uh, the officer came around and started doing mail call. And I got a letter from my mom and uh, I started reading it. And it said, uh, son, I love you. If you don't get right with God, you're going to die alone. And uh, I broke down because I never realized how alone I really was until that moment. And uh, I had a Bible sitting next to me that one of the Gideons gave me. And I opened it up to uh, a famous verse that, you know, a lot of people know at The Rock. And, you know, it's in Acts 20, 24. And, you know, I started reading it and it said that, you know, neither I count my life dear unto myself. And that's when I realized that it's not about me. And this, this feeling came over me that I've been selfish. And that I'm not alone. That, that God is right there with me. You know, holding my hand, saying, you're, you're going to get through this. You're going to get through this. And I remember the next day I called my dad. I said, Dad, I got to go back to The Rock. I said, I got to go back. And uh, I remember, I remember when I finally got to The Rock, I walked in. Sam was singing a Revelation song. 
And after that, Pastor G started preaching. You know, I remember the sermon title was either you're with us or against us. And uh, that's when I started realizing that either I'm for God or I'm against Him, you know. And that's when I realized that, that this isn't about me, that it's about everybody else and the baby dedications that were going on and the, 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 the prayer. And the, I could feel the power in that place. And I've never been to church before in my life. Like maybe once or twice when I was a kid for Christmas or for Easter, but not church. After service, I walk up to Tom and I said, bro, I says, I want to come back. And he looked at me and I remember what he said. He said, you know, you ready to do it right this time? Uh, you know, he kind of had a smirk on his face. And I said, yeah. So now that I'm at The Rock, you know, I help Tom oversee the house of Paul. I see men's lives being changed, becoming great men of God that, have, you know, that, that they're called to be. Uh, I help Pastor Arson run the youth center by, by helping him build baseball fields and becoming, you know, uh, a, a blessing to the to the inner city kids to to give them an opportunity and a safe place to be. Um, but I look back, I look back at my life and I realize that the life of selfishness and the life of drinking and partying and and the drugs and alcohol was nothing compared to what God had for me and what He has done in my life and what He's done in my life right now could never change my feeling for him or for anything else that is going on. I love what I do and nothing in this world could change that. Imagine staying in this moment. My family lived in Wantaw, Long Island. My mother was from the South. And there was my dad who was an alcoholic and a gambler. And my parents never shared a bedroom or a bed. So there was fighting about that. My dad came home in the evening from work. He would start and his was always about sex. There's no sex, I sleep alone, I sleep with the dog. You know, I'm tired of this, I'm tired of this. And one night their fighting was louder and uglier than, than most nights. And I was shaking, I, I was shaking, and I just said real loud, I'll sleep with Daddy. So after a while, I got tired of that, and I ran away, and when they brought me back, I said, I'm not sleeping with Daddy anymore. Pretty soon afterwards, went to Wantaw Junior and Senior High School, and I was gang raped. They would come to the house in the late afternoon with a carload of boys or men and I, I would go with them and while they were abusing me they would talk filthy about me and they would threaten me and that ended only when their girlfriends came to the house one evening. The next morning I told my mom well I can't go to school anymore so I started hanging out in Brooklyn and I started working in the sex industry. When I was 23, I was introduced to the chemical wines, Wild Irish, Mad Dog, and heroin. And heroin was my love from the second. It was just, it calmed everything. So I took to the streets to live. And when that was over, I figured I'd move to Richmond where my mother and my sister had been. In October of 2000, I moved here. In 2007, two years later, Barbara missed the last two sermons at The Rock because she was in MCV hospital. And it was her liver and she went home to our Lord September 2nd. So I just got on my knees and started crying. And I, I took her Bible and I couldn't understand it, but I, she had all kinds of marks in it, you know, scriptures in it. So I would read those. In June 1st, 08, Dee came to my house. And she said that Pastor G sent her here and he wanted to know what I needed. And I said, I don't need anything. I need you to listen. I, and I was a hostile person. I was filled with anger. I, I, 
I mocked our, our God and I mocked his son Jesus. But one day, I received a letter from Dee. And it was a beautiful letter. It was so compassionate and so, so beautiful and so kind. And one sentence was, Pastor G says you must forgive if God is going to give you the rest and the peace that he wants for you. And I kept reading, reading, reading that one line just over and over. And I thought, well, if I've got to forgive, then I've got to forgive everyone. Now I know it was the Holy Spirit. And I was, it was painful. And I didn't know what was happening. But I started seeing my life the way, the way it really was. And I had always seen it so different with that letter in my hand and with all that Barbara had tried to teach me and all that I had read in her Bible, I knew, and she had said it again and again and again, the only way we get to heaven, God brings us to his son and then we accept him into our heart and give him our lives and and that 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 all happened i my sister was there the people i had i i had hurt so badly were there and i saw all of it every every person i had ever blamed for my life and it was all me with my hatred and my anger and I, I even forgave the men who had raped me. And I started coming to the rock. I sat in the first row. I did not want to miss a word about my God. And a woman, Sherry, one day, she came and put a King James study Bible on my chair. And I fell in love with that Bible. I fell in love with it. And um, I don't only read the Bible, but I pray and I read and I give and I go. And I love every second I am here. And um, this is my first church ever. And Pastor G is my first pastor and I love him and all the pastors. And this is my 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 first Bible here. It's 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 such a so many stories, so many dramas, and so much sadness. And 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 I and I just love it. Hi, my name is Old School. I'm from Charleston, South Carolina, and I'm 46 years old. Before I uh, moved to uh, Charleston, uh, I was a, not even a year old. My parents broke up. I had an older brother. He's 13 months older than me. Uh, my mother became a diabetic uh, the day after I was born. And uh, she was real sick, couldn't work. My dad really wasn't there. So uh, my mother had a decision to make. Uh, she didn't want us to live with her parents because they were poor and uneducated and uh, she didn't want us to live that kind of life. So she decided to send me and my brother to Charleston with my, my father's parents and they raised us. Uh, growing up, uh, I considered my childhood a blessed life. I mean, uh, we got everything we basically wanted. We got the best education from kindergarten to 12th grade. We went to private school. Uh, I got involved with drugs. Early on, around the age of 11, you know, started smoking weed and drinking and, uh, you know, I just like smoking weed. I, I mean, laughing and eating and I excelled in sports. And that's how basically me and my brother made our friends in the hood. Once they saw that we were just as good as them or better than them in sports, we became friends. Uh, after uh, my uh, drug use really intensified once I got in high school, uh, 
like I said, you know, private school, the kids got the money and I got the connections in the hood. So it was a marriage made in hell. Uh, after uh, graduating high school, I had another decision to make, you know, um, I wanted to travel and I wanted to, to make money. And the next thing that came up to me was the military. So I went in the Air Force and uh, uh, the first couple of years were great. I got to travel a lot, meet a lot of different people, and, and, but I continued to, to use drugs, knowing the consequences. You know, if you get caught, and eventually you will, but I continued to use drugs like there wasn't gonna be any consequences. Uh, and finally, I did get popped. Eventually, that caught up with me again. I got caught on another drug test, but this time they found cocaine. Uh, during that process, I uh, got introduced to cocaine by my mother's sister's husband. He was a drug dealer down in Savannah, and we were close uh, as far as distance go to where I was stationed. So every weekend, I would ride down there and, and uh, do my thing and bring the drugs back to Warner Robins. And uh, not even thinking, you know, I'm in the military and I'm bringing drugs on the base. I'm, I mean, I was stupid. You know, things just uh, really started deteriorating. Now I'm smoking cocaine, uh, crack, and uh, that changed my life forever. Uh, from the ages of 22 to 32, was back and forth to different rehabs. I got sent through the VA to Charlotte uh, to a program called Rebound, which was started by Billy Graham. And that's where I got saved at. And uh, salvation was kind of easy to me to receive because of the things that I had witnessed as a child and being raised Catholic and all of that thing, stuff had kind of shaped me in realizing that I could never be good enough, you know, to go to heaven on my own. So it was kind of easy for me to accept. Uh, the other part, the discipleship, uh, I didn't know nothing about. Um, I got involved in the ministry in Charlotte after Rebound and I was doing uh, ministry work there. And, uh, you know, they hooked me up, me and this other brother with a place to live, and we did ministry work. We worked for the church. And uh, pretty soon, you know, both of us started using. And it was always something missing. I couldn't, never figure it out. You know, I'm saved, uh, I'm feeling good, and all of this stuff, and I just couldn't figure this thing out. But one day, And I made this uh, foxhole prayer with God. I, I was like, yo, God, if you, I, I wanted deliverance from, from drugs and alcohol. I wanted him to take it out of me completely. I didn't want anything else to do with it. I said, if you do this, I'll serve you the rest of my life. I mean, you got me. And, uh, you know, I said that thing and, and something happened. You know, I stopped using. And then uh, I still had the, the dreams and the thoughts and all of that. And I was like, I wonder why God won't just deliver me from this. I mean, just take the taste out of my mouth. Things got real bad in Charlotte and uh, I went to the uh, VA there. They wanted to send me to Richmond because they have a, a rehabilitation place at McGuire. That's what I did, but when I got there, and on the last three days, they started doing your discharge planning with a social worker, and I told her, look, I don't want to do no Oxford houses. I don't want to do no kind of rehab or nothing. I want to go to a, a Christian faith-based place. And uh, that's when I heard about The Rock. And uh, so she got the information for me, and I called, and I was told to come. Pastor Allen interviewed me. And then I went to God's foolishness, and that's called the House of Paul. And uh, I learned a lot there. I mean, uh, just watching Pastor Allen, Pastor Ranch's uh, New Wine classes, and the Set Free classes, and the Bible studies, and all of that. And then uh, I was only planning to stay 10 days, I gotta be honest. And uh, the 10 days went by, and I just froze. I don't, I and mean, it had to have been God. And I, and I stayed, and the next thing I knew was two years later. One of the prideful things I did is uh, I went to Pastor G one day, 
and told him you didn't ever have to worry about me with the, the women, you know what I'm saying? I already had been married twice. Uh, I didn't see that in the future for me. And then one day, this girl came, woman came into the homes and I didn't like her. I didn't like the way she walked. I didn't like the way she talked. But you guys know what it was, you know. I, she was beautiful and my eyes saw it. I don't know what happened, man. I, I just fell for this girl. So I had to tell Pastor G, I was like, hey, Pastor G, uh, remember when I told you you wouldn't have to worry me about this, but these girls? And he's like, what, you like one of them? I was like, yeah. So he said, you lied. And I said, yeah. Six months later, we were married. Now, you know, God has given me a purpose back. I can be uh, the husband I was called to be, the leader I was called to be. Uh, I just enjoy doing ministry. I mean, I, I just can't see doing anything else. Uh, I'm not uh, immune to the, the things, you know, that go on in everyday life, but uh, I know that God's got my back and that the people at The Rock uh, want the best for me. And the only thing I can do is, you know, try to be an example to others. And I hope my story can help other people. Imagine staying in this moment. Stay Hello, I'm Robert Brooks. I was born here in Richmond, Virginia, and I'm 47 years old. I was born with several parties. I grew up with my brother and my sister and my mother. As I was growing up, my mother had to be do chores, just as she had my brother and sister do chores. And I grew up um, taking, basically dressing myself, you know, taking care of myself, doing what anybody else would do. And I um, learned how to be independent by doing so. I appreciate what my mother did for me because she made me stronger. That's how I was able to live alone. I've been living for alone for 27 years now. I give my mother credit for, for bringing me who I am today as far as being independent and doing it for myself. I, um, I also um, went to, was able to go to school. I went to the Richmond Center for Project Center. I, I um, graduated from that back in 84. Right after I graduated from high school, I um, moved into my own place 27 years ago. And um, I didn't really have a lot to do. I didn't know a lot of people. I didn't know this area that well. And I um, just kind of hung out to myself. One day, I went to this place called Pure Pleasure. I started hanging out there and, and I felt comfortable there. The people treated me nice. The people there treated me like I was one of them. And um, I did some crazy things while I was there too. And I wasn't always perfect. I never said I was be perfect. But I did, I, I wanted to do right. But I didn't have the right directions to do right. And when I went to Pure Pleasure and back from Pure Pleasure, I had to run down when I didn't talk about in my wheelchair. When I went to, to different stores or whatever on my love I had to go down when I was in the top to get to where I wanted to go to. On March 16th, 2002, I was coming from Kmart, going down my love in the top I was hit by a car. I hit a rock. I um, was you know, not out of my wheelchair. You know, I was you know, pretty banged up. Um, I spent a week in the hospital. I had to get a new wheelchair because my other wheelchair was tore up. But what you don't, what you don't realize, the seat itself was all one piece intact. And God had his hands Allow me, save me, keep me, keep me safe. I do believe, and I do know, and I do feel that God was with me that night when I got hit. And I, um, I gradually got better. As I went to Pure Pleasure, they had the rack on the, on the warehouse. 
Live with all these energy to come on in and have service for them. So I would leave the club and they would have church services right across the street. And I would feel awkward, you know. I wanted to go, but I, I just felt awkward about, you know, going there. So I would, would never go there. As I said, I was going, I've been going to the Pure Pleasure for 10 years. And I enjoyed the fellowship and the, the friendship and all the good things, all the things at the, at the club with the guys, hanging out with the guys, you know, joking with the guys. But I just felt like there was something missing in my life. But one day, three, a few years ago, a friend of mine named Debbie told me about the place called The Rock. I asked her, well, I said, what is The Rock? And she said, it's a church. I said, well, really, what kind of church? She said, it's a church to teach about more and more about God and about Jesus. Robert and I have developed a really good friendship, but I do consider him more like family. He's got a great sense of humor. He's a good person to be around, and I can be myself, tell him anything, and know that I'm not judged. Right or wrong, he, lo he loves me. He's one of those people that I feel that when Pastor G talks about people seeing Jesus and qualities of Jesus and other people, he's one of those people I think about, and I love him for that. If you have a chance to go introduce yourself to him, if you have not already met Robert, which I highly doubt it because he's such a social butterfly, um, you should go up and meet him because he truly will be a blessing in your life. So I went there and I loved it, and I've been going to the rock ever since. I, again, I travel on my lunch and travel like, to wherever I go, to, basically wherever I go to, and go to and from the rock with the wheelchair. But when it gets dark, you know, now I have a, a, a van, a rock van, that they purchased for me to ride. And I'm very thankful to the rock for acquiring that vehicle for me. And I can get there a whole lot quicker, a whole lot safer. The rock is coming to me. You know, people say, they're going to rock. I feel like the rock is coming to me. It, it just made me feel, feel good that, you know, my church, you know, is, is close, to, close to me. And I just feel like I'm close to the, everybody that's there. I feel like the love there is a, is a, you know, there is no better love than, than the rock. Love is the rock. Like I said, I haven't lived a perfect life. I haven't been, you know, done bad things, bad things, but I haven't done great things either. And I just feel like, as I grow, as I keep going to the rock, as I grow in Christ, I will get, grow to be a better person every day. What I remember most about my life is a struggle between God and Satan for my soul. One of the first memories I have is sitting on my front porch and, um, thinking about God and how God was love and uh, he created everything and that he loved me. I can remember being 14 years old and uh, telling God I was going to go my own way for a while. I spent basically uh, the next 30 years um, going into darkness, going into it as far as I could get into it just trying everything to replace Jesus. I thought that my body was my own and I did with it whatever I wanted to do. And um, I put needles in my body. I uh, drank like crazy. I um, shared my body with anybody I wanted to share it with. And, uh, didn't understand what happened because of that. Didn't understand how much, what I was doing to my soul, what I was doing to my spirit. I finally got to a place, uh, I was married twice, um, divorced twice. Uh, I um, 
got pregnant uh, when I was um, 18. And um, then I got married and um, had uh, a son um, by that marriage who um, I gave custody of him to his father when um, he was three years old. Um, some of the reason of why I did that was I didn't want to mess him up. Um, it was right around that time also that I started my trip through in and out of mental institutions and off and on every kind of medication you can be on. And um, this anger start, stuff started coming up and I would take it out on um, on my son and I just was really scared and I wanted to go play and so I gave custody of him to his dad and um, I kept using and um, I kept trying to figure out uh, who I was and I had no had no idea who I was. I just really didn't care. Um, I just really didn't care. But one day, I ended up going to an outpatient treatment which meant that I could still go to work. And um, I was going to meetings. That was part of my requirement with the outpatient. And I ran into somebody in the meeting that I'd known for 20 years. And so, um, you know, he gave me his phone number and I was talking to him on the phone one night. And um, I said, what are you doing? And he said, I'm reading the Bible. So I said, well, what's the, you know, that, that's good. And he said, well, you should go to the rock with me sometime. And so I said, what's that? And he said, well, it's a place where there's a message and there's music and there's fellowship. And, you know, it's, it's a real good place. You ought to try it. And I said, can I bring my kid? And he said, it's all about kids. So I came to the rock. And I can remember sitting there and um, watching these people sing and thinking, what is this? What have I walked into? But I thought, okay, this, this is good. This is good. I like this. And then uh, Pastor G started talking. And I'm, I'm thinking, okay, God, what do you got me back in here with all these Jesus people for? What, what's going on here? Why do you have me back here again? So I walked up there and I get uh, to the uh, altar and I said, okay, I'm already a Christian, so I just want to rededicate my life to, to God. So the guy looks at me and he says, okay, but can I ask you a question? And I said, okay. And he said, if you were to die tonight, are you 100% sure you would go to heaven? And I lost it. Started crying like I hadn't cried in years. Don't know where the tears came from. I mean, <gasps> I'm sobbing crying. It's like, no, I don't know. And uh, something happened that night. Something happened at that altar. It's, um... Okay, now that I'm at the rock, I am involved in um, working with women. I get to work in the food pantry. I'm in the choir. I'm the lady warrior. I'm a prayer partner. Um, I get to uh, praise Jesus all day long. I get to glorify him with every minute of my day. And uh, I had no idea that life could be this wonderful. God promises that he is able to give us exceedingly above and beyond what we can think or ask. I have a vivid imagination and I can think and ask of a lot. He's already topped that just in the peace that I feel.
I was born and raised in Richmond, Virginia in 1995. My childhood was a little crazy. Um, my father left before I was born. My mom got pregnant with me when she was 18. Uh, like it was just, I lived with my grandmother for most of my life, for the first few years of my life because my mom suffered from a crack addiction for a while. Um, she got it, she got everything back together and met her boyfriend from way back in middle school and they got married. He was a like mentally abusive alcoholic until I was about the age of 10. And that scarred a lot of bad memories into my head from just him threatening to leave to him going to kill himself. And that stuck with me through everything. So I had a, a ton of anger built up in my heart from my childhood all the way up until I was a teenager from, I had 14 years of hate for my father who left my mom. I just couldn't understand why he did it. And that destroyed me. And it just, I had so much anger from that to where I just, I told my mom, I just I was like, I want to kill this guy. And I didn't even know him. And that ate in my heart. And it just, it made me more prideful. And that hurt me more in the long run too. I wasn't, I wasn't really involved in any church growing up. My mom tried to get me involved, but I tried to pull away from it as much as I could. Um, school didn't really help any of my situations at the time. Uh, science especially, it introduced me to evolution, and I was kind of naive. I was thought that if a teacher taught it, it must be right and true. I just, I never wanted to have God in my life. I just wanted to find a way to get him out of there and prove him wrong. I guess just to be stubborn at the time. My grandmother told me about The Rock when I was about 11 years old. She told me that they had a cool skate park and I would love to go and I was like, all right, I guess I'll try this thing. It wasn't really much of a fan of the church thing, but I was like, I'll check it out because it's something I like to do. I just thought it was a free pass to heaven. And I could just take advantage of it any way I wanted to. Um, I started playing sports and my junior high school, I started running track, and then came people trying to make, show me how to smoke weed, and before I started smoking weed, I started taking pills before any of that. Um, I would come home and tell my mom I had a bad day, go in my room, and I would take an oxy and just go to sleep. And then when I got into high school, it just escalated a little bit more, I started taking Oxy's more often, Hydro's, Vicodin, and I started smoking weed whenever I felt like it. Whenever I got bored, I would go hang out with my friends and just smoke. I just, I started not caring. Like, if you asked any one of my friends, I was just the kid that didn't care. I just, I was the kid that I'd go do anything you wanted to, just chill and hang out and whatever, and just not really care about what the future had. I was just living it up for that day. But one day, my mom came home one day from to get me for Saturday service at the Rock, and she told me about the bus ministry she did that day, and she told me that she wasn't really giving me an option. I had to go. I had to try it, and I told her I like I kind of fought it and tried to think of an excuse to get out of it, but I kind of just accepted it, and I said all right. And I remember my first time doing it, it was the first week in November. 2010 and I was on Gilpin's bus and it was crazy just the kids they were all excited about coming and that was the first time I was ever in any of their neighborhoods just and it made me really respect life and to see that they were struggling with so much more than I was that their parents were smoking crack and getting high all the time and they some of them didn't even have parents at home to watch them. They were just getting on the bus because they were allowed to do whatever they wanted to. So it made me realize that what I had wasn't, like what I was going through wasn't as big of a problem as what they were going through. And I could kind of relate to them and I could help them and I could talk to them. And just, I could be myself and help mentor them from what I did know. And that made me feel good about myself for once. I just started coming every single week. Like I loved it. I started doing the kids' Christmas party, and that was some of the most fun I ever had. Like, it was just a blast because all these kids—they were just so happy to come see people that loved them, and then they loved us back. And 
Like even if we were having a hard time at home, these kids made us feel like there was nothing going on. Like they almost helped me escape the reality and it wasn't using drugs anymore. It was joy and happiness and it was amazing. Um, after I kind of hit my low with everything in life, I kind of just, I turned to God for everything for the first time in my life. I finally got into reading my Bible and that's when my life really started changing. My mom is, she's been like my best friend through everything because she had me so young. She's always happy now and that's, that's all I've ever really wanted for is just for her to be 100% happy and that's what The Rock has given her. Since I've been at The Rock, God's just blessed me with this amazing family and they support me in everything I do. I have the greatest pastors ever. Pastor Andrew's been like a, a dad to me. He's mentored me so much. He answers any questions I have and he's just, He's always there to talk to and it's fun and it's different because he has tattoos. It's just he's not the normal guy you'd see, uh, see as a pastor and that's what I like about it here. It's amazing. I started living my life like I was supposed to for the first time ever. And my life got good for once. It was just a good and everything was going right and I was happy and everybody around me was happy and it just like everything was going straight up and it did. Hi, my name is Tracy. Some of you know me as Springer. I was born in 1966 on August 3rd, 44 years old. My life was, uh, I had a good life as a child. It was, it was a farm life. Um, my grandma and grandpa lived across the street. My uncles and my cousins all lived down the road. I had my dirt bike and I was a very outgoing kid. I liked to run track. I met up with some of the wrong people and uh, started drinking at a young age and uh, experimenting with other drugs. I had a motorcycle accident uh, when I was 21 years old, and uh, it, it put me in the hospital for about a month and a half. Um, God seen me through that. After that, my health really started going downhill. But, you know, I continuously, continuously drank. It just, it was tearing, tearing everybody apart. My mom, she prayed for me all the time. I know she did. I didn't care. I was out drinking, got really drunk. And I went by my ex-wife's house with a 38 pistol. I went behind the house. I sat down in the lawnmower, just like I'm sitting here. Pulled the hammer back and stuck it in my mouth. So anyways, I've, she finally talked me out of it. I put the gun to my side and I walked around the house to leave while the lights came on. And the police said, freeze, drop it. They put me in a police car and the police officer looked at me. He said that I had two sharpshooters with their scopes aimed at my head. If I would have turned that pistol towards the house, they would have killed me. So there's two times within five minutes that I should have been dead. Um, four years later, I got into another relationship, went to the house, her house, her ex-husband was there. I lost control. She called the police. I left. The police caught me at my house. I was looking at some serious jail time. But I remember one night he called, and it was about two in the morning, and he was in jail. And I'll never forget, it was like when that was the final thing for everything to be ripped out from underneath me. And after I hung up the phone and was going to wait till morning to see if we could bail him out one more time or what would happen, I actually got angry at God for the first time. But I didn't say to God, this can't be worked out. I remember laying there with my eyes shut and saying to God, I can't wait to see how you're going to work this one out. They went to the doctors and the, they've done the surgeries. They've done everything they could possibly do to save my foot. And they said I was going to lose it. That was devastating. I didn't know what to do, what to think. I didn't, I was lost. But one day, well, when I got out of jail, I went straight to the house of Paul right after Christmas. I got kicked out of house of Paul after 30 days, but I wanted to stay in the ministry. So I came up here to Hanover Vegetable Farm because I was coming here through the house of Paul. And I knew Jeff, and uh, Jeff worked it out where I could stay in the ministry. You know, coming to The Rock, I was doing everything, but there was still that battle. 
And I think that battle will be waged the rest of my life. And it's just a matter of me saying, in the name of Lord Jesus Christ, Satan, I rebuke you constantly over and over. They taught me in the house of Paul, Romans Rhodes. Romans Rhodes is not only good for soul winning, it's good for everyday life. I repeat it in my head all day long. Anyways, since then, after my leg amputation, I've gotten a lot closer with my father, with my stepmother, my sister, her husband, and I've got this huge family. Not only my immediate family, but my family at The Rock. I'm a soul winning soldier and I'm so proud of it. I wear my colors with pride. And being a soul winning soldier means so much to me because the soldiers were there when I was in the hospital. The soldiers were there when I went to court. The soldiers were there for all that. So, and it was just an awesome, awesome ministry to get into. I love being a soldier. I, uh, I love what it stands for. Um, I love going to the outreaches, um, being around everybody at church. Want to say I'm a mama's boy? Absolutely. Love her. She's, she's my mom. God uh, worked it out where I could be in the ministry because he knew that's where I needed to be, not in jail. Imagine staying in this moment, staying in this moment. Hi, my name is Whitney and I was born and raised here in Richmond, Virginia. Both of my parents have been in my life, um, have been very active in my life, and they were very loving and giving parents. And I'm very thankful that I had that structure in my life. I had a pretty normal teenage life. I was, you know, a very reserved teenager. I, I was very active in sports and um, other, you know, uh, things after school, extracurricular activities, that sort of thing. Um, Never really got in trouble, um, stayed to my family and my friends, you know, went to the movies on the weekends. It was a pretty normal life. When I was 14, I got saved. I was very active in my youth ministry at my church, um, took summer trips to go out and talk to others about God. And um, those were very, very important trips in my life. Um, just taught me a lot about God and who I was as an individual. Um, so I've been very blessed and um, God has done that for me. And then um, I eventually um, got married and um, to um, a wonderful man. Um, I fell in love with him. We dated for four, almost four years. Um, and then we got married. Um, and as the years went on, he um, got involved in um, alcohol and drugs. Um, I had started drinking or had been drinking. You know, we went out and did things, partied with others. Um, and his just got really, really excessive. And not realizing that, one of his bosses came to me and said that we needed to sit down and talk to him about it. So we did so. Um, and I told him that he needed to make a choice. And his choice was to go in the back room and pick up his laptop, a set of clothes, and a bottle of liquor and leave. When Jay left, I was absolutely devastated. I felt like, the only man that I ever loved have just left and I just didn't understand it. Um, and that was devastating to me. I felt like I had um, failed at my marriage. I had failed, you know, I compared myself to my mom and dad who had led such an awesome life. And I was starting to get angry at that time. Like I didn't understand, like I was angry at God. I didn't understand why my husband had left and why he was so sick and and I really did I, I really just started to make my own choices I didn't lean on God anymore um, and I lost myself I lost who God wanted me to be um, and I got involved in a relationship where I was introduced to cocaine which eventually took me to smoke and crack um, and that was, that was really, um, 
I, I lost all concept of anything. I didn't care about my family anymore. I didn't care that girlfriends didn't want to have anything to do with me, that my brother didn't want to have anything to do with me. I was numb. I was completely numb. And um, after getting high that first time, I chased it. And I chased it hard for two years. And in that two years, I lost my family. I lost my home. I lost my friends. And I lost myself and God. But one day, back in October, had called one of my girlfriends. I didn't have a place to rest my head that night, and I called one of my girlfriends, Kristen, and by the grace of God, she answered the phone. She um, was on her way out to work. It was in mid-afternoon. She was on her way out to work, and she answered the phone, and I said, Kristen, I really need help and somewhere to stay, and she said, well, come on and get the key to the house and you can stay here for a little while. And um, from there, you know, she stayed in contact with my mom and dad and let them know that, you know, that I was doing all right. Um, you know, I was, I was, you know, trying my darndest not to, to get high at that point. And eventually I came back and lived with my mom and dad. Um, my mom had been fellowshipping with, um, having fellowship with another woman from her work um, and she had actually talked to my mom about um, the rock um, and then when I did come back home and live with my mom and dad you know I wasn't I, I, I wasn't of clear mind and um, and I stayed with them I'd you know go out on my binges for you know three or four days at a time make them wonder where I was they were seeing it you know up close and personal right there in their face at the time and that was just devastating for them I took it upon myself to take their vehicle because I wanted to go get high. And then Richmond City picked me up a week later in their vehicle and arrested me. And they took me down to Richmond City Jail. Um, and I was um, locked up for 13 days. God was definitely humbling me at that point. Did I understand it? No. I mean, I was calling my mom and dad, please come get me. And they were like, no, we're glad you're there. You know, you need to, you really need to think about, you know, what's going on. You need to think about what you've done. Two days after I got out of jail, I went into intake and um, I came into the House of Mercy. When I first met Whitney, um, she was like most disciples, her life was in, in disarray and really needed the Lord to do a healing um, in, for Whitney and for her family. Whitney was a total delight. God did a total transformation almost immediately in her heart. I believe that Whitney got what she came for at The Rock, a personal relationship with Jesus Christ, which has forever changed her life. God has done so much in my life. It is so amazing the peace that He has put in my life and where I am today. Um, to laugh again, to love again. Um, God has restored many, many relationships in my life. Number one being God, being number one, but most of all, the most important was my mom and dad. And God has done that. My mom and dad are wonderful people and for God to forgive me and to put them back in my life so that I have them each and every day is unbelievable. Imagine staying in this moment, stay in this moment forever it's Hi, my name is Tony. I'm 28 years old and I was born and raised in Richmond, Virginia. My parents were um, addicted to drugs. Um, you know, their lifestyle revolved around drugs and alcohol. Their drug of choice mainly was heroin. And um, at the age of two, um, one night my dad had came home and um, was strung out and didn't have any drugs. And uh, beat my mom to a pulp and killed her. Uh, my dad, uh, went, he went to prison um, probably for a good two, three years. And then after 
he was in prison. Um, he had died. Somebody found him, found out that he had killed my mom. So my aunt and uncle took us in, um, took us in and adopted us, and we moved to Richmond, Virginia. And uh, that's where I met my best friend, Jerry Mullins. Uh, me and him lived a lifestyle uh, partying uh, every day from uh, sun up to sundown, going to school. Uh, that's when we got um, in trouble a lot uh, through school, um, doing drugs. Uh, first started out smoking pot. Um, and then, you know, later on after that, we uh, traveled to cocaine and, um, you know, I'd done the, the mushroom air, you know, I've done acid, I've done all the drugs there is to name. Um, you know, uh, the, one of the worst times that for me in my life was uh, the main one where I started losing myself and giving up was um, when I lost one of my best friends, uh, Brandon Jenkins. That was the bottom for me. Um, it was the bottom for me to uh, lose somebody like that. Um, took a toll on my life. Um, well, after he passed away is when I slipped back into my addiction. Um, I partied more. I was further into my alcohol uh, addiction. My drug addiction led to uh, cocaine, crack, and I finally found myself drinking about four cases of beer in one night. Um, doing all the drugs I could to ease the pain of uh, one of my lost friends that I know I was never going to get back. Um, my addiction was so bad at the time. I really, I was lost. Uh, I had no relationship with anybody in my family. I lost all my family. My addiction was close to about four or five hundred dollars a week. Um, there were some nights that I spent uh, up to three hundred dollars on, you know, doing drugs. I lost all, every single bit of life there was. You know, I wanted to uh, get help, um, to seek, uh, to seek help, but I was so scared and I was so caught up in my addiction, um, that I, d I really didn't care. I just wanted to die. But one day, but one day, um, I took, I took the decision and I called my best friend. I said, Jared, I said, I need help. Um, I can't live this life anymore. Um, I need, I need somewhere a positive, a positive function. I need somebody uh, to to teach me, to guide me. And he said, "Look, man," he said, "I'm on the way." Um, that night, Jared picked me up. I went to where I was staying. I grabbed my belongings, and he took me to the rock. And he said, "Tony," he said, "These next six months to determine what you're going to do with your life." It's up to you to decide what you're gonna do. Um, so I did the best thing I could do, and I just, you know, I'm gonna go for it and see what this this person, God's got to offer. So I go to the rock during service. Pastor G was preaching, and he said we're gonna do an altar call for everybody who doesn't know and have a personal relationship with Jesus Christ to please come forward. And after I got saved I cried out to God and I finally accepted Jesus into my heart um, all that pain um, all the affliction all the everything that I went through from you know losing my losing my mom and losing my dad uh, losing a relationship with my sister um, and I'm all getting that back now um, you know, me and my sister's relationship is being restored. From there, it was, you know, what am I gonna do? Where am I gonna, what am I gonna, you know, how am I gonna do this? Um, well, you know, it's 
you got to give your life to Jesus Christ. You got to you got to have that faith and you got to have that trust in and what he can do with your life. Well, I didn't really know who God was until you know I finally started opening up the Bible. Um, now I am uh, I'm still at the House of Ranch. Um, I'm involved in some of the ministries at the ranch. I work at the Hanover Vegetable Farm with Jess Sears, a great guy, great mentor. Um, he's just been a blessing in my life, and I just want to give thanks to him. Uh, his whole family uh, for supporting me and making me feel like a positive person again. I work with a good group of guys at the farm. Um, I just work there six days a week. On Saturdays, I'm involved with the uh, kids bus ministry. I do the kids bus ministry and then I do the adult ministry on Saturday nights and pick up all the adults for church. Um, it's just a blessing to uh, you know, to have all these things and, and, and live for somebody that who does care for you, who does love you, and there's no better high than Jesus Christ high. Imagine staying in this moment. Hey, my name is Brandon Lanny. Um, I was born and raised in Central Florida. I, uh, lived there most part of my life. I grew up in a, uh, I grew up in a Christian home. I grew up with going to church every Sunday, being real involved. My grandfather was a deacon and a Sunday school teacher. My father was as well. And so we were really involved in the church growing up. Um, you know, when, when I was about 13 or so, I had my first beer and smoked, smoked my first bit of pot when I was about 13. And from then on, it was just kind of like a, uh, hit or miss all through my teenage years. Growing up, I was at a Christian school and everything. You know, I, you know, when I went to high school, that was about the first time that I really started becoming friends with people that came from different homes. I went to, it was my first time ever going to a public school. Um, right away, as soon as I came in, I uh, kind of put everyone from my past and my childhood behind me. I made all new friends right away. I really kind of just quit hanging out with everybody that I grew up with from my kindergarten to eighth grade kind of just went on my own, started skateboarding, skateboarding more and just uh, getting really involved with that group of kids who hang out at the local skate park every day, hanging around with a bunch of the BMX kids and um, just started surrounding myself with those people and I felt, found a little hope in some of them that came from Christian homes and was like convinced my parents that hey yeah they came from a Christian home too so it was alright for me to go hang out with them even though they weren't living the life that, uh, that I was brought up living. There, there was a, a couple of those friends from the skate park that we really started hanging around each other a lot more. We started buying a lot more pot. We started, you know, we started selling our own pot, trying to make some money. We tried, started hooking it up at kids at the skate park. Some of my other friends at the skate park started finding other drugs, you know. I always thought, no, I wasn't going to be, I was, I was just going to be a stoner, and I was okay with that, you know. I would drink on the weekends and smoke pot. And uh, some of my friends that were still in high school started finding other drugs. I'm sitting at the table just staring off into space at Thanksgiving dinner, not eating a thing. They started wondering and uh, I remember everyone got up from the table except for my grandmother and my mother. And they decided to have this talk with me at the Thanksgiving table about weed and cigarettes. And I just look at them like, you have no idea what you're talking about. You have no idea what I'm messing around with now and you're trying to have your first talk with me ever about weed and cigarettes. And so I take it, I just listened to them and got up and left, went back to the skate park that day. I'll never forget. The kid, when I was walking up to the skate park, one of my uh, old friends who kind of went his own way when I started doing the heavier drugs, I was walking up to the skate park and all I hear is, oh, here comes Laney, he's all strung out again. So all this went on for a little while. I, I tried to move away. I went to Georgia with my cousin and my uncle for a little while, found out my, uh, my cousin's doing the same mess I'm doing. That didn't work out, so I moved back to Florida. Lived up in St. Augustine and uh, stayed there for a few years. You know, I, I found a nice little hole in St. Augustine. I got away from the drugs for the most part. I uh, kind of put all that stuff behind me and became more of an alcoholic. And I moved to St. Augustine. I started selling pot right away and just uh, met up with a bunch of the punk kids in St. Augustine and uh, became pretty good friends with all of them. Ended up living with them 
in a house we had down there called Fort Booyah and um, you know it, it was just a show house we had bands play there two three nights a week it, it was the life man it was for about a year straight we just had shows going on all the time bands from all over the country playing the more beer than you could ever imagine and just you know that's what my life revolved around the drugs kind of took back burner for booze and um, and that's what my life turned into my life turned into a non-stop party at that point you know I hopped a ride when I was drunk one night got a ride forgot how I even got to Richmond and then uh, a second time was about a week kind of did the same thing just hopped a ride up to Richmond I was in Richmond for four months is where I met um, is where I met my my wife I met Ashley up here and um, so I went back to Florida and while I was back like I talked to her a bunch and had to come back to Richmond to, to be with her pretty much and I was like I gotta go back but one day so when I came up between the time that I left and came up she got involved with the rock and uh, she said the only way she would hang out with me is if if I came to church so I said okay and I came to uh, I came to my first new line class with Ashley with Pastor Ranch and uh, I fell in love with it right there. The past two years God's really blessed my life. Uh, I ended up marrying my, my wife Ashley. Um, we just celebrated our first year anniversary back in August and we have a, we have a baby on the way due in February. You know, I'm a, I've been blessed with the, to be an overseer of a discipleship home. So summer of 2009, Pastor G allowed me to start a, a bicycle outreach where uh, it started out originally just going out into, uh, with the Rock on the Road outreaches and doing free bicycle repair for the kids in the neighborhoods. But right away we saw it was a big hit, so he allowed me to just make it a weekly thing through last summer and last fall, and we watched it, and we were able to fix just last summer and last fall about 300 bikes for kids. So, so we were able to get a, a grant this past year where we can get more parts and more, more stuff to fix bikes for more kids. and. Uh, we, we've been able to do that to give away a, probably over the past two years uh, close to 100 bikes or so just to give away to kids who don't already have bikes. You know, I'm, I'm serving at the big house every day. I'm just living my life for God, you know. It, it's, it's, it's awesome what God's done in my life. And, you know, you live your life for Him. He's going to bless you. Imagine staying in this moment. Stay in this moment forever it's true I remember growing up in a home just with my dad, with my mom, um, a lot of drinking, a lot of stuff went on that kids shouldn't really be exposed to. And um, As I got older, I started yearning for that relationship with a male, with a mother, because my mother wasn't in my life. My mother ended up leaving when I was like 14. Um, at the age of 15, I got pregnant with my first son, Brandon. He actually passed away at about six months old um, of SIDS. I don't know if you've heard of that. It's sudden infant death syndrome where the baby dies in their sleep. And he was five months, eight days, and he passed in his sleep. And after that, I lost it. I started getting involved in relationships I shouldn't be in. I started drinking. I tried meth. I almost OD'd on meth. I had to be put in the hospital because I did too much of it one night and I didn't know what the proper amount was to do and I didn't care at that point. Um, at that point in my life, I was waking up in the middle of the night and making him bottles, like thinking he was still with me, like up getting him bottles, thinking I needed to. I'd wake up and I'd just make him a bottle. And ended up um, getting out of that relationship. But before I got out of that relationship, I got pregnant with my daughter. When I was about 19, I got involved with another guy. I was still just going down the wrong path, not doing the things that I knew I was supposed to do. My daughter was about four and um, met uh, another gentleman, and that's my son's father, Gavin. Um, and I shortly, right after that, I came to the church. And when I came to the church, I was so broken. Me and the kids were literally living in a tiny apartment, like a, like a studio apartment, 
Gavin had a playpen. Emery had clothes. She slept with me in my bed, but it wasn't like it wasn't the best situation. I was drinking, I was smoking, I was doing the things I shouldn't be doing. I was struggling financially, like just everything. I had so many things weighing me down, like so many things against me, you know, like it, it was really terrible. And I came to the church and the first time I came to the church, like I felt the presence of God like I had never felt before. Like I knew I was supposed to be there. I knew that God had something for me. I didn't know what, I didn't know who God was or I didn't know any of that stuff, but I just knew it was something different, something I had been looking for my whole life. It's been about six years since I've been coming to Desert Life Church and the blessings that have flown into my life and in my kids' lives, like seeing them transform. Like my daughter, she used to be scared to go up to any men. Like she'd cower like if Andre came by her, she'd get nervous, she'd get scared. And now she runs up to everyone. Now she's just like a little light. And I have got married. I got married about four years ago to Mike and he loves my children as his own. Like he would he would never see them any different. Um, we have Jalen, who is uh, two, and then we have another one on the way. Um, and it's just amazing to see what God has done in the six years because my dad is now in the church. His life is completely transformed. Like God has done a radiant miracle like within him. Like it's so amazing to see my dad. And my brother comes to the church now and he's, his life has changed and transformed. My sister's been coming and it's just amazing to see like how God can use a testimony or things that happen in someone's life and he can really help to transform other people's lives. And I'm just really like, at the, like I'm doing a Bible study out of the house. I'm so on fire for it. Like I'm so excited about the study. I'm excited about the women that are coming. I'm excited about the changes that are happening already in their life like praise reports, like, it's just amazing. It's amazing when you're on the other side, how you can really see God working and what He is doing and the real plan He has set in motion for all of us and what we're called to do. It's amazing. What a blessing it has been to hear these precious testimonies. Ah. <sighs> I pray that God has somehow used them to uh, touch your life in a special way. Uh, if you've been flipping channels and you're not sure what you're watching, it is the Precious Testimonies broadcast. We're a non-denominational outreach ministry, you know, just giving born-again Christians an opportunity to share uh, what He has done in their lives. Our purpose uh, is... Um, Primarily to help people come to the salvation knowledge of the Lord Jesus Christ. And for those who've already made a commitment to just one we call Jesus, that they would grow in their relationship with God. Okay? That that would uh, continue to prosper so that these people would become all that God would have them to become in their lives. That's a process for each of us. Now, <clears throat> perhaps you have never, ever made a commitment to Jesus Christ. Perhaps you've never asked him to be your savior. Perhaps you don't even know that he would like to be your savior. Let me explain, because sometimes we Christians assume that everybody on planet Earth has clearly heard and clearly understands why Jesus is a Savior to so many, why He would like to be your Savior. Jesus Christ, the Bible says, the New Testament Bible says, was fully God before He ever came to Earth in the form of a mere man. Okay? In fact, the New Testament Bible clearly states that he is the second person of the eternal Godhead. The eternal Godhead being God the Father, Jesus Christ the Son, and then the Holy Spirit, or the Holy Ghost, if you will. And Jesus, who the Bible says always was, in fact, it was through him that all things have been created, and nothing has been created except by him and through him, of course, he worked with the other two persons of the Godhead, we, we can assume safely. 
he was uh, he came down from his glorious position from heaven and came down into the form of a mere man he lived this life as a mere man not as God but as a mere man he purposely set aside his Godhead his deity so that he could be tempted like every other human being ever has or ever will be tempted to sin and we're told in the New Testament Bible that he never sinned once and so because he was the only acceptable sacrifice to God the Father and of course the Holy Spirit he was the only perfect man sacrifice that God would accept to pay the penalty for all of our sins. And that is exactly what he did. He allowed himself to be uh, punished and bruised, beaten, tormented beyond anything we can imagine, and then hung on a cross, whereby taking the punishment each of us are due for our sins and so he then died he resurrected three days later later and then went back into his glorious position whence he came from before he will return again to accomplish some things that need to be accomplished we won't get into that in this setting but suffice it to say that God himself came from heaven when he didn't have to, died for us, taking all of our punishment so that on the judgment day, when we give an account to God, which we all will, we can be free from God's wrath or God's punishment so that we will get to spend eternity experiencing eternal joy with God. God wants that for every created person on this planet. But he gives us a free will choice in the matter. We must ask him for it. We must trust him for it. Okay? It's a free gift. This free gift of pardon. Free gift of forgiveness. That, my friend, is what makes him the Savior. He saves us from the penalty of of sin that God has decreed is against every human being and somehow it has to be nullified well Jesus the Savior is the one who nullifies it and so when we ask Jesus to be our Savior we're asking him to save us from the penalty of all of our past present and future sins which the Holy New Testament Bible says he does when we ask and so if you have never ever asked this Jesus to be your Savior friend, I want to make it as easy as I can for you. You don't need anybody to pray for you. You can pray for yourself. It's a matter of saying, well, Jesus, if you're the Savior, uh, save me from my sins. Now show me what you want me to do from here. It can start out as simple as that, okay? And God knows your heart, you know? I mean, God, God knows whether you're serious about all of this. God knows whether you're going to give your life to him or not after this moment, after asking him to be your savior. And so that means that he desires to set up a lordship in your life. He desires to help you become all that he desires for you to become, starting out in this life, but for all eternity. And we've run our own lives up till now. Okay, we, we've de made, made our own decisions, and most likely, you're probably not very happy with the results of the decisions you've been making up to this point. And so now, God is looking to see if you're willing to let him help you make decisions that he has a power to make happen as he wills. You see... We can either go against God's will or we can get connected with God and go with God's will. God wants us to go with his will, but he won't force it upon us. We must ask and we must patiently trust as best as we can that his will will be manifest to us and unfold in our lives once we've made him our Savior. And so that is the process of growing in our relationship with Jesus Christ. 
The Holy Spirit is freely given to each and every one of us to help accomplish that. But the complications come in where our will basically likes to have its own way because we're born sinners. We're born selfish. And so it is, uh, it is, it is our makeup that wants to make our own decisions and expect God to bless them. Well, if the Holy Spirit orchestrated, he will in his own time and his own way. But if the Holy Spirit didn't orchestrate it, he's not obligated to bless it either. And so that is the frustration of every Christian you will ever meet if they've been a Christian for very long. It's like, wow, I thought life was tough before I became a Christian. Well, now it seems to be even more difficult. Well, what happens is we make it difficult. And that's not to put a guilt trip on anybody. It's just that we are masters at being our own lords. Uh, and um, there can only be one Lord. His name is Jesus Christ, the Creator. You see, He created us to glorify Him. It's not the other way around. And yet, we have a hard time dealing with that. Well, God is patient and He's graceful with each of us. And so, my friend, let's say a little simple prayer that you can follow along with if you would like. Otherwise, if you want to have Jesus forgive you of your sins, you can do it in your own way. Let's pray. Jesus, I ask that you forgive me of all my sins. Fill me with the Holy Spirit so that he would help me connect properly and then let you, Jesus, be Lord of my life from this moment forward. I confess to you that I have been a rebel. I confess to you that I wanted you to bless my own decisions and I've not incorporated you, you or your will into the decisions I've made in times past. Forgive me for that and help this moment in time start a new day a new time period where we get it right. Help me to get it right with you. And I'm asking and trusting that you will. And I thank you in advance for it. And it's in your name I give thanks, Lord Jesus. Amen. You can pray that prayer every which way you can imagine, my friend. It's the heart that God is looking at in each of us. And he knows who wants to mean business with them, or those who just want a fire insurance policy. Um, you will meet a lot of Christians along life's way that really just want a fire insurance policy. What's that? Well, they just don't want to go to hell after they die, which that's a good reason, okay. But God is expecting more of us than just staying out of hell. He's wanting not only to be our Savior, but also Lord. Lord means we willingly give him the right to have full say in our lives. Don't misconstrue, don't misunderstand. He's not looking for puppets. He's not looking for puppets. He honors our free will above all else. So we must ask and we must trust. We must willingly learn how to trust that the decisions that he would have us make are designed to help us to be all God created each of us to be. Let's take a little sidebar here, my friend. If you've never thought about this. You see, none of us know what God has planned for each of us in eternity. He's clearly said in the New Testament Bible that we who are born-again Christians are co-heirs with God. We're going to reign with Him. Well, we're royalty. That's what that means. We're godly royalty when we're born again of God's Spirit. And we purpose to let Him rule our lives. But my friend, that is an eternal endeavor on God's part. We don't know what God has planned for each of us in eternity. This we know by collective revelation from the Holy Spirit. 
that this life is our training ground. It's our testing ground. It's our training ground. And God trains us after we become Christians to become more like Jesus Christ. I have been in a real big struggle with my life, trying to do good and be right by God, but at the same time, as I say, putting him on hold to go party, do drugs, run amok. My mother, she had to go out of town from Mount Maugie to Duncan, Oklahoma. And the whole way down to Duncan, she kept praying about me and my soul to save me from these drugs, save me from the devil. And she didn't know why she was in such deep prayer all day. Until later that afternoon when she got the phone call that I was in ICU, that I'd been in a horrible wreck. The rear driver's side tire popped and I slammed inside of an 18-wheeler diesel. Spun around and went underneath the trailer and it ran over the car. I was crushed down in between the floorboard and the steering wheel and it took 45 minutes for the paramedics to get me out of the car with the jaws of life. When I woke up in the hospital, my entire body was swollen from head to toe. They had to trach my throat for me to breathe again. I had broke my left clavicle, broke all my right ribs, many fractures to my pelvis, ruptured spleen. This last year of my life had gotten really hard. I'd been divorced for over three years. I only got to see my girls when my mother was in town. We would fight a lot because she was trying. She saw how bad I was on drugs. I was hard-headed. She would be talking to me about drugs. I didn't want to hear it, of course, because I was in denial. I would run to women. I would run to parties. I would run to drugs. I would run away from God. And she prayed really hard again and said, I give it all to you, God. Save him. Save my son. Waking up after a month of being in ICU, I could not walk, I could not talk, and I thought I could write, but it was all scribble. And when I woke up, I was, like I said, addiction free. Didn't want to do any drugs, didn't want to smoke any cigarettes. And I don't feel that pull like I used to. I used to feel a pull every morning when I woke up from the devil. And now it doesn't seem like that anymore. The Wednesday, before the Believe program. I could not walk. And it seemed like I was the last one there with Pastor Sharon just praying over me and praying over me. And then that Sunday, I rushed down because I saw Pastor Sharon was down there. Look at this brother. Praise God. We just prayed the other night for him. Praise God. He came in a wheelchair here to the service and uh, he got run over by a diesel truck. He hadn't been able to walk and he's been believing God that he's going to walk again. Look at this. Let's all rejoice. God still works miracles. Glory to God. Two weeks later, I got out of my wheelchair for good. Every day gets better and better. God is constructing me back to where he wants me. It's just amazing how the transformations happened, how good I feel all the time, and how different I look at life, how precious life is.